The slide presentations for this lesson are broken into three shorter slideshows so that it's easier for you to watch as time permits. In this one, we're going to look at an overview of disease and some important words that you need to learn as we're going through the semester. These definitions are important because it talks about what a disease is and the different types of diseases. Disease is any time there's a pathological or dysfunctional part of tissue, organ, or body system. It's usually caused by an infection, a genetic defect, environmental stress, and it's usually characterized by identifiable group of signs or symptoms. When we talk about disease, there's two main types. The first one is communicable, and that's a condition or disease which is capable of being transmitted from one living organism to another. And sometimes it's transmitted through vehicle, which is a non-living organism to a living organism. The second type of disease is a chronic disease, and that's a condition or disease which persists over a long period of time. Most chronic diseases are non-communicable. We will be spending the first half of the semester on communicable diseases and the second half of the semester on chronic diseases. Here is a list of causes of death in the United States in the 1900s, in, 19, in the early 1900s, 1940, and 2000. I'd like you to take about 15 seconds to look at the list and the chart and to see if you have any things that you see are different or unique or intriguing. I will give you about 20 seconds to review the list. So there's usually some things that people see, and I've highlighted the items that most people see immediately, <clears throat> and that is their changes from communicable diseases in 1900 to where they are in the list in 1940 and in 2000. As you can see, communicable diseases moved down in the list and chronic diseases moved up in the list. And that's really important. So we need to ask ourselves, why did that occur? And there are a variety of reasons. Here are a list of some of the reasons that caused communicable diseases to move down on the list and chronic diseases to move up. The first is that we have cleaner water and sewage systems. In the early 1900s, most people were on wells or had septic tanks, or they did not have septic tanks and they just threw their waste into the city streets. That caused lots of problems in spreading communicable diseases. We also have refrigeration now, and refrigeration allows us to keep our food at safe temperatures. In the early 1900s, some people had ice boxes but that was not the same as refrigeration. We also have trash disposal now. In the early 1900s, most places did not have trash disposal and trash was just put out on the streets or left out. That caused problems with attracting rodents and sometimes spread disease. We also have antibiotics today. And if you think about the diseases that are communicable that move down on the list, many of those are treated with antibiotics. So because diseases could be treated and cured with antibiotics, people lived longer. And because people live longer, it's more likely that chronic diseases occur. If a lot of people are dying in their 50s, they typically don't have time to develop cancer, which occurs later in life in most cases. So because people live longer, there's automatically a change in diseases because of what has time to develop. Most people would agree that our stress levels at this point in time are higher than the stress levels of the 1900s. And we also have a much better understanding of disease and disease concepts than we did in the early 1900s. And that has led to better definitions and classifications of diseases, which has sometimes changed the way they're reported and appear on the top 10 list. On this slide, we're looking at some words that are important that I think you will see as you're writing your paper. So it's important that you understand these words so as you're working on your papers that you can actually think about what these words mean in relationship to the diseases that you've chosen. Epidemiologists are scientists who seek to discover causes of disease, patterns of disease occurrence, and they recommend measures so that pathogens can either be prevented, controlled, or eliminated. 
So a lot of times when you're looking at material for your paper, you're going to see epidemiology. And epidemiology means the patterns, the causes, the measurements that we use to measure disease. One way we measure disease is using the words endemic, epidemic, or pandemic. So to review these words, endemic means that there's a constant presence of a disease in a population. One example is there is typically a consistent level of common cold in certain months of the year. There are also consistent levels of gonorrhea and chlamydia on most college campuses. An epidemic occurs when an outbreak of a specific disease is in excess of what's normally expected. So if one year, for example, the flu has a much higher level of, of occurrence in a certain area, that might be considered an epidemic. Or on a college campus, if gonorrhea or chlamydia have a spike in incidence, then that too might be considered an epidemic. A disease is pandemic when it's at an epidemic level and it's widespread over a country, a continent, or is worldwide. So for example, there were times in the past when a flu was actually considered pandemic because it was throughout the world. Um, malaria would be considered typically an epidemic because it doesn't occur all over the world. However, it might be spread in a very small area of a country. Other than uh, the flu, that's the main disease we often hear of as being pandemic. Another disease that is sometimes referred to as being pandemic is HIV infection. This is another set of words that you're going to find as you're reading literature on your diseases, and that is the way we report the rates of disease occurrence. The two main ways it's reported is prevalence and incidence. Prevalence indicates the number of cases of a particular disease in a community at a specific time. It gives us an ongoing measure of the level of disease in a population, and it's usually expressed per thousand or 100,000 people. So if we're looking at president prevalence of HIV in the United States, in most populations there's been a consistent level over a period of time. Incidence, however, indicates the number of new cases occurring in a specific time period. Usually that's measured in a year, and usually it's reported in 1,000 or 100,000 people. So if there's a prevalence at a certain level for a long period of time, and in one year there is an increase and spike in the number of new cases of HIV infection, that incidence level, that spike of new cases, tells us something about what we need to do in preventing the disease. And that's important to understand because prevalence is long-term. This is how many people have it at any point in time. And incidence is the number of new cases. And those two words will be important as you're looking at your diseases. The next words that are important is to understand how prevention occurs at three levels. And there are three levels of prevention that are often discussed in the literature. Those levels are primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary prevention is defined as preventing a disease from occurring. And so some examples include laws that make it illegal or difficult to obtain alcohol. So if it's difficult or illegal for certain age groups to obtain alcohol, that is a way to prevent alcohol issues from occurring. Vaccinations used to prevent disease is an example. Environmental controls, so if we're looking at Lyme disease and there is a program that eliminates the areas where uh, ticks may occur, ticks may live, that would be an example of an environmental control. Product safety might be the packaging of medications so it's more difficult to get to them or the use of condoms to prevent the spread of a disease. These are all examples of how primary prevention might occur in preventing a disease from actually happening. The secondary level of prevention leads to interventions that hope to discover or control a disease and to prevent more serious conditions or illness from progressing. So when we have cancer screenings like mammography, that's an example of a secondary prevention. Screenings for high blood pressure cholesterol are also secondary prevention. 
When we do STI or sexually transmitted infection screenings to get early treatment, that's secondary prevention. And other examples listed on the slide, regular metal exams, daily dose of aspirin, or modified work for people to return to work are all secondary level prevention. They're designed to control a disease or prevent a disease from becoming more serious or progressing. And the last level of prevention is tertiary prevention. And this is designed to prevent the impact of the disease from having a long-term effect on people with chronic conditions. Listed on the slide are some examples. If someone has a stroke and they go to cardiac or stroke rehab to regain the ability to use parts of their body, that's tertiary prevention. If we provide support groups for people who have chronic diseases, that also is considered tertiary. Maintenance of diabetes to prevent other issues like vision or amputation issues, that also is tertiary. The person has the disease and we're trying to maintain it at a level that prevents other issues. Vocational rehab for work-related injuries or surgical procedures to correct or improve chronic conditions is also tertiary. So if, one, if someone has atherosclerosis and they have a surgery to widen their arteries, that is an example of tertiary prevention. So that concludes the lecture overview part one. And hopefully by looking at these, you're able to use some of the words and understand some of the words that you're reading in the literature.